Chapter 3, as we learned last time, <clears throat> Paul moves from teaching, from doctrine, from fact after fact after fact into the world of practice. What do we do with it? He moves from truth to application of truth. What do we do with it? What are we supposed to do with it? Paul, uh, in chapter 3, will give 15 commands. I'll point them out as we go. 15 commands to the Christian. These aren't suggestions. These aren't for the church in Colossae and only them. These are commands for every Christian who lives. <clears throat> 15 commands in chapter 3. Uh, he begins this next major section with these words. Listen to what he says in Colossians chapter 3, verse 1. He's leading to a discussion of following Jesus Christ, focusing on Jesus Christ. That's the theme of what I'm going to say today. We must turn 100% of our attentions onto Jesus Christ, who He is, His character, and, and uh, try to live a life, strive for a life that imitates Jesus Christ. Not the Gnostics of chapter 2, not the legalists of chapter 2, not the ascetics of chapter 2, not the mystics of chapter 2, but Jesus. And now he shifts away from all that wrong view, that wrong focus, and says, if you have been raised with Christ, he says in, in 3.1, therefore... If you have been raised up with Christ, and we have, it's a first-class if condition. Uh, first-class meaning if and it's true. Second-class, this is a Greek thing, uh, but the Greeks have four different ways they use the word if. And sometimes it, the way it's structured in the Greek language, it's if in the first-class condition, and it's a supp the supposition is let's consider this to be true for the sake of argument, if and it's true. A second-class if clause is if, and let's consider for the sake of our argument that it's not true, if and it's false. A third-class condition is if, and maybe it's true and maybe it's not. And a fourth-class condition is a, a wishful if. If, and I really wish it was true. I wish in my heart this were true about you. Paul uses that fourth class if several times in his epistles to speak to the churches and say, I wish this was your heart. I wish this was your behavior. I wish that it were true. This is a first class if clause. If and it's true. So it's a, it's a since. It's a true statement. Since you have been raised up with Christ. It's a true statement. And we'll talk about what that means in just a second, to be raised up with Christ. But look what he says. If, and because we know that it's true that you have been raised up with Christ, Christians, then keep seeking the things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind, two, co two commands here, seeking is a command. Set your mind on is the second command. Set your mind on the things above, not on the things that are on the earth. We're commanded by Paul, God the Holy Spirit, through Paul to, to have not this horizontal focus. You know what horizontal means, like the horizon, side to side focus. We're commanded by God to have this vertical focus, not on circumstances, not on people, not on trial, not on tribulation, on the Lord God who sits enthroned in heaven at the right hand of the Father. That should be our focus as Christians. Not on the Gnosticism, the mysticism, the legalism, the asceticism, not on systems, on a person, the Lord Jesus Christ. That's his theme here. That's what he's saying. We should all be living like this. We should set our minds and seek the things above, not the things that are on the earth. In verse 3, he says, For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with Him in glory. Oh, I forgot to show you this picture of this guy. <clears throat> Charles Spurgeon. Anybody read Spurgeon? I read Spurgeon sometimes, and I read it very slowly. Because it's hard for me to read that these and thous. But I love this phrase, and we're just going to be on this for a second. Nobody ever outgrows Scripture. The book widens and deepens with our years. Uh, I, I heard somebody say one time about the Scriptures, about the Bible, that the novelty, uh, the novelty never wears off. 
Uh, the idea being, you know, a kid at Christmas time gets this gift that he's always wanted just all his life. And he, wake, he opens it at Christmas time and he thinks, this is just going to make my life complete. And by about four o'clock that afternoon, where's the toy? It's over in the corner. He's done with it. He doesn't even know why he wanted it in the first place. It didn't have the novelty, the novelty that he thought it had, that shininess that caught his eye. It wears off. It, the novelty wears off. It's not this greatest thing ever anymore. What Spurgeon said is, is every time you open this book, it's the greatest thing ever. The novelty of it, the wonder of it, the shininess of it, the thing that attracts you to it. If you will go to the book, it will attract and amaze you every single time. You'll never outgrow the book. It continues to widen and deepen with our years. And boy, is that true. Uh, I can tell you, I've never known the Bible better than I have today. I'm not telling you I know everything in this book. That's not my statement. But honestly, I can tell you, I've never known the Bible as well as I know it today because I've spent the last several years as I've been your pastor in this book all the time. And I can tell you, there are things I know right now that I can teach you right now that I couldn't have come close to teaching you seven years ago. I just didn't know them. I couldn't have bounced around from chapter to chapter, verse to verse with the way I do it now. And I guarantee you, I promise you that in 10 years, I'll look back on the pastor I am today and say, boy, I can do things now and teach in a way I just didn't understand these things then. And that's what he's saying. This book will never outgrow me and this book will never outgrow. You will never outgrow this book. Excuse me. It's an impossibility. It's filled with marvels. It's not a book you read once and say, well, I read the Bible, I'm good to go. You should read this book annually, several times through, continuously, all your life. You will always learn things in every page of the Scripture. I bet you could read the same verse 30 days in a row. One verse, challenge yourself to read, read one verse of the Bible 30 days in a row, and I bet you every day you'll see something you didn't see the day before. That's how huge God's mind is. And what we have here is a little token piece of God's mind encapsulated between these two black leather covers, and you, can't, you could never uh, out... Uh, outlearn the mind of God. The scripture says, calls itself the mind of Jesus Christ. So back to Colossians chapter 3, I just wanted to show you that. What does it mean then? He says, we have been raised with Christ. What does that mean? This has the idea of identification again. Remember, to be identified with Jesus Christ, to be placed in union with Christ and identified not only with his death, which means what he did for me, I did. I get the credit. I get the credit before God the Father, and we all do, for what the Lord did for us. When God the Father sees us, he considers us having been crucified on a cross, having been buried, and having been resurrected for three days. Uh, this chapter says it. The book of Romans chapter 6 says it. The book of Galat Galatians speaks of it, that we share in the inheritance of Jesus Christ. Now, that's an impossible thought. But it's true because God doesn't mind giving. It doesn't take anything from God to let us share with Jesus Christ. He gives us good gifts and perfect gifts, and every good gift and perfect gifts comes from above. This is another one of those grace blessings He gives us. We are raised with Jesus Christ. What Jesus did in His death, burial, and resurrection has been credited to every one of us who have believed in Him as Savior. An astounding truth. We're identified with His work. We're clothed with His righteousness. Uh, imagine that. This filthy sinner, uh, and I'm pointing at myself, this filthy sinner, uh, when God the Father sees me, sees me clothed with the perfections and the righteousness of His Son, Jesus Christ. Do I deserve that? It's, a, it's a, almost an impossible statement to make. If I didn't know it to be true from the Scripture, I would never utter those almost blasphemous thoughts. But it's true that this filthy sinner is clothed, and you filthy sinners, let's all get in this uh, mud, mud bath together. When God the Father sees you, Christian, when you wonder, who am I? Am I of any value? Do I have anything to share? Do I have anything to contribute? 
You remember who you are. You're a child made in the image and likeness of God. As a Christian, as I'll say in just a minute, there are a lot of things we have. And we bear the robe, the righteousness of the living God, Jesus the Christ. An unfathomable truth, but a truth nonetheless. What Jesus did in His death, burial, and resurrection, God the Father credited to our account. We're identified with His work and we're acceptable to the Father because of the work that Jesus did that we share in. It's nothing that we did. It's what He did. So here we see that we have been raised with Christ, not resurrected. This isn't talking about resurrection, not in our present condition. We have been raised with Christ, but not to immortal life. That's not the focus here at this moment. We will be, and that's a promise, a guarantee. One day we'll be resurrected to immortal life, but not yet. The truth here is that we are already as good as resurrected, and so live like it. We're as good as resurrected and seated with Christ in heaven. What He does, we get credit for. And since He's been raised, we have been raised. And since He has been seated, we have been seated. It's a phenomenal thing. Uh, But our present truth today as Christians is that we've been raised to new life. And I'm going to discuss that new life in just a few minutes here uh, as we continue on. But we've been raised to a new type of life, a spirit life. Life with the human spirit. That's a new thing. Not just a body and the soul. Remember, uh, here's what I want to say. Remember that God reveals to us in the Bible that Christians are three-part people. We're three-part beings. Our existence has three parts now instead of just two like an unbeliever. We truly are reborn to new life. And Paul is saying, since you've been raised, since you have this new life, live like it. Live like the risen Christ. You also have been risen in a way. Uh, So remember that God reveals to us in the Bible that we have three parts. The body and the soul and the spirit. Look what it says. I'm going to show you a couple of verses in case anybody is wondering. I make this statement to you. The unbeliever, anybody that you know in this world that has not placed their faith in Jesus Christ has a human body that we can all see and a soul that is eternal. Nobody will ever die eternally. Nobody will ever go out of existence is what I mean by that. Believer and unbeliever will live forever. You precious souls, the beloved, those who are in union with Jesus Christ, where will you go when you die and are resurrected to immortal, glorified, imperishable life? Where will you exist? Wherever Jesus Christ is, that where I am, you may be also. Whether it be time in heaven, time in the new Jerusalem, time on the the, uh, thousand-year millennial reign earth, wherever it is, you will be in the presence of of the Lord Jesus Christ. He makes us that promise that where I am, there you may be also. Not so for the unbeliever. The unbeliever has a body and a soul that lives forever, but where will they go when they die physically? They don't go out of existence. They just because they don't believe in Jesus, this is a horrific thought, but it's a thought of God. It's a truth of the Bible. The unbeliever goes uh, to the lake of fire eventually and are tormented day and night in this fire and this brimstone. The Scripture teaches that clearly. That was was what Adam uh, gained for us in the garden when he bit the fruit. So what happens to an unbeliever when they believe in the Lord Jesus Christ? They take on something that they didn't have before. They they are created in them is this human spirit. Uh, Let me show you a couple of verses. Look at what it says here. I want to prove that we're three parts. 1 Thessalonians 5.23, it says, May the God of peace Himself sanctify you entirely. This is Paul's uh, closing statements to this church in Thessalonica. Uh, Thessalonica. He says, And may your spirit and soul and body be preserved complete without blame at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. You see how Paul separates us into three parts as Christians? This is a Christian church, the Thessalonica, the Thessalonians. And he speaks of spirit, soul, and body. Let me just tell you what those words are. They are three different words. 
The Spirit is the Greek word pneuma. For those of you that are new in the Bible, the Bible wasn't written in English. The Bible was written in Hebrew. And the Bible was written in Greek. The New Testament was written in Greek. When Paul wrote these words, he didn't write Spirit. He wrote pneuma. He was writing in the Greek language. Uh, and that's why when I show words like this, I'm not trying to show off, ooh, look what the pastor knows. Who cares? We're trying to learn the Word of God together. I'm trying to expand and, and tell you what the Bible says. And Paul used the word pneuma here. He says we are a spirit. And what is a spirit? It's an immaterial part of believing man received at the point of belief in Jesus Christ as Savior. It's immaterial. Uh, if I were to be cut open, you say, well, the Spirit's inside Rick somewhere. Yes, it is. But you could cut me into a billion different pieces and you would never identify the Spirit because it doesn't have matter. It's immaterial. You can't grab it in your hand like you could my heart or my liver and say, oh, look, here's Rick's part. Not trying to be weird or gross. I'm telling you, the Spirit has no touch. It's immaterial. More like an angel. Now, I'm not saying we are angels, but it's immaterial in that way. It can't be grabbed and held on to. It's an immaterial part of us that we don't have before we're saved, but after we put our faith in Christ, God creates in us a spirit. Paul also says that we're a soul. You say, and, I, and I'm dif differentiating these, and I'll tell you in just a minute, because some people like to say, no, we're just body and soul, and the spirit is part of the soul. I don't believe that. I don't know why Paul would have said three things instead of just two. I'll show you that in verses here in a minute uh, why I don't think we are two parts. I believe wholeheartedly and will the day I die, we are three, body, soul, and spirit. What is the soul? It's the immaterial part of mankind. The soul is um, uh, more things. It's, it's life on earth. It's life on earth in its animating aspect making bodily function possible. It's the life giver. The soul is what's alive. The body is only alive because the soul is in it. The body is alive because this life-giving soul is in it. So that should give you a, a, a peek into what happens when we die physically and you have a dead body, but a what? an eternally living soul that's outside the body. I'll say something about that in just a minute. The soul is the life giver. When the soul leaves the body, the body has no life in it. The soul is the life giver. Uh, it can also be considered the breath of life. Old Testament, nephesh, the soul, the breath of life. And God breathed into Adam the breath of life. Uh, from Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, the breath of life. Uh, or it could be the life principle. The life principle, the, uh, the, the basis, the origin, the structure, the foundation on which life or from which life comes. That's what I mean by principle. Without the soul, there is no life. There is no animation. There is no bodily function. There is no communication. There is none of that without the soul. The soul is the life. And then we have this body he speaks of. The Greek word is soma. Did I tell you what this word is? Uh, uh, suke or siki is how a Greek would say it. Uh, the siki. What word do we get to that from that? The psyche, psychology. All those words come from this Greek word for soul. Because what is psychology but not a study of the real man, the soul, the inner being, the thinking of man? That's where they get the word from, soul. Suke. Or Siki. And then you have body. Paul says that we're a body, the soma. The soma. And what is the body? You can see the body. This is an easy one. But it's not just humans. It's anything that has life. It's the entire physical structure of an organism. The an, uh, an organism, an animal, or a human being. Uh, your dog has a body just as much as I have a body. Uh, so it's any living organism has a body. You know, you don't, nor you don't normally uh, talk about a tree having a body. But all animals have bodies, don't they? All lizards have bodies. All fish have bodies. We know that intuitively. Uh, things that are alive have bodies. That's what the body is. What I'm trying to tell you is, is that Paul says we are three parts. We are a suke, 
We are a soul, we are a body, a soma, and we're also a spirit, a pneuma. And he's talking to believers, not unbelievers. Uh, so being raised up with Christ here, he says, since you are raised up with Christ, it's the truth, has to do with our newfound human spirit and our new life in Jesus Christ, our new life with Jesus Christ, the ability to live in union with Jesus Christ, able to be his ambassadors, his representatives on this earth. Don't you see, we couldn't do that before we believed in Jesus Christ. We can only do that once we get a human spirit at the moment we believe. We can be his ambassadors. We can represent him. The unbeliever can't do that. The unbeliever, according to the words of Jesus, is of his father, the devil. Lost in a world of sin. Lost in a world that can only sin has no human spirit, doesn't have God the Holy Spirit in him, cannot please God with anything he does other than the decision to believe in his son as his savior. And then he becomes a child of God and start pleasing God. A couple of verses because some disagree with this division of soul and spirit uh, as to being two different parts. I don't know if you know that, but some thinks it's only body and soul. And I'm talking about some great thinkers. It doesn't matter. This is not a hill to die on. I just want to show you some verses because this church and our Constitution very clearly teach and believe that we are, as Christians, a body, a soul, and a spirit. And so I want to show you where we get our beliefs from. A couple of verses to defend the belief that the soul and the spirit are two different things. In Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, for the word of God is living. Everybody knows these verses. For the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. Talking about the Bible. And piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit. You can split them into two parts. The word of God can split the soul and spirit into two parts. They must be two parts. It can divide joints and marrow. You say, Rick, I could make an argument either way there, but what about joints and marrow who's, uh, who's placed in, uh, in a union or in um, parallel with the, the soul and the spirit? Joints and marrow are two different things, aren't they? Anybody who knows anything about physiology, joints and marrow are two different things. So are the soul and the spirit, two different things. The Word of God is able to pierce even as far as the dividing of the soul and the spirit of joints and marrow. The Word of God is able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Look at the next verse. John chapter 3. Ring any bells? Who's Jesus having a conversation with in John chapter 3? Who? It is Nicodemus. The Pharisee who's afraid to come to the Lord Jesus during the day because he's afraid the Pharisees will see him. It'll make him look bad. So he sneaks in at night. That's good. He snuck in. The other Pharisees didn't sneak in. It's like Peter getting a bad rap for getting out of the water and, and then looking at the water as Jesus is walking on the water and losing his faith and losing his focus and saying, oh, and he sinks in the water and some people say, oh, you of little faith. I say, no, you of gigantic faith because how many people got out of that boat to walk on the water with Jesus? Was strong for a moment, the strongest in the boat, Peter got out and wanted to experience what the Lord could do. But in John chapter 3, Jesus having this conversation with Nicodemus, this is what Jesus says. Jesus tells Nicodemus all throughout this, Son, unless you be born again, you cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Nicodemus comes and says, we know you're a great rabbi, uh, you're a great teacher, we know God is with you, you couldn't do things like that if not God was with you. Jesus, in essence, cuts him off and says, unless you're not born again, uh, yes, thank you for the flattery, you're right about all those things. But let's cut to the chase here, Nicodemus. I know you're here for an answer, and the answer is you must be born again in order to be saved. That's why you're here. You think I'm who I say I am. I'm going to prove it to you. And Jesus says, that which is born of flesh, speaking of this being born again, somebody tell me, what was Nicodemus' answer to Jesus when he said, you must be born again from above? Nicodemus says what? How can I what? How can I enter into my mother's womb a second time to be born again? And Jesus said, no, you're missing the point. I'm not talking about fleshly birth. I'm talking about a different kind of birth. I'm talking about a new birth that only the Christian will ever 
uh, experience only the one who believes in me. Jesus says, that which is born of flesh is flesh. Nicodemus, you're talking about having been born of a human mother. Human flesh begets human flesh. That's not what I'm talking about. And Jesus says, that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. So Jesus intimates here, look at what it says in the verses before in John 3, 3. Jesus says to Nicodemus, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one, you, because you've come asking the question, unless one is born again from above, unless one gets a life given to him that he doesn't currently have, spirit life, he cannot see the kingdom of God. That's what Jesus is teaching. You don't get to heaven without a human spirit. And at the moment you believe in Jesus Christ, you pick up, you are created in you anew. A human spirit is given back to you. Don't you know that's what Adam lost when he bit the fruit? When Adam bit the fruit, we call it spiritual death. But if you break that down and turn it around, it's the death of the spirit. Adam's spirit died that day. He was created body, soul, and spirit to, uh, to commune with God and worship God and glorify God and all of those things and rule the earth and subdue the earth and all of those things Adam was, was called to do uh, as a body and a soul and a spirit. But when he bit the fruit, his spirit died and he began to die physically. His body began to die as part of the curse of his spirit death. It took 936 years to die. So we are two, uh, two parts as unbelievers and three parts. Let me ask you a question. When Jesus said this to Nicodemus, unless one is born again, he can't see the kingdom of God. And when Jesus made this phrase, you can't be born of your mother again. What I'm telling you is you have to be born of the spirit again and get a human spirit. What did Nicodemus have? A body and a soul and what else? Nothing. But he clearly had a soul. Because without a human soul, that body has no life. He was a, this is my argument, Nicodemus was body and soul, eternal body and soul, on his way to the lake of fire, comes in to see Jesus to say, what must I do to be saved? Jesus gives him the great verse, for God so loved the world. This is a conversation with Nicodemus. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in Him, Nicodemus, you want to know how? Believe, and the Spirit will create in you a spirit. That's the born again Jesus was talking about. But the fact that Nicodemus was alive, a body and a soul, uh, is, is obvious. He had to have a soul or he would have no life because the soul is where the life is. But the point is, he did not yet have a spirit, did he? Jesus says, you have to get a human spirit, and God the Holy Spirit is the one who creates human spirits. Unless you are born of God the Holy Spirit, you don't have a human spirit. I, I made a statement earlier, so going back to body and soul, let's ask, answer the question in case you've ever gone to a funeral. And just not knowing exactly what was going on there. What is the relationship between the body and the soul? The answer is the soul gives life to the body. The soul is the life. The soul animates the body. It gives life to the body. The body is alive because of the presence of a soul inside of it. Two statements. Listen to me. The soul can be alive without the body. My father, Robert King Sr., is alive today. He's in the presence of Jesus Christ. His soul and his spirit are alive and well. His body lays in a grave in Corpus Christi. I can visit that grave and I know when I'm standing there, my father's six feet below me. His body is dead. But my father's alive and well, but his body is dead because the soul can be alive without the body, but the flip side is not true. The flip side is the body cannot be alive without the soul. So what happens at physical death? Separation. That's what death means. The word thanatos in the Greek 
That's what the word means. It means separation, for something to be separated from something else. And so in Luke chapter 12, verse 20, this is the phrase we get, but God said to him, remember the rich man who's got all this, all these crops. He doesn't have enough place to put his crops. So he says to himself, he, he has a conversation with himself. You ever say this? You hear it in jokes. So I said to myself, self? In Luke chapter 20, that's exactly what this man does. He says, I talked to my soul. And I said to my soul, soul, what do we do about this problem? You got too many, too many crops, not enough barn. And so what he did, he focused all his attention on the crop. I don't know what, the, what he should have done with it. Maybe give it away. I don't know what the Lord was intending by that portion of it. But what he focused his attention on was all his material wealth and his crops. So he spent all his time building this bigger barn and God comes along. And because his focus is wrong and on all this materialism, God says to him, you fool. This very night, your soul is required of you. And now who will own what you have prepared? All these large barns filled with all your stuff that you thought was uh, worthy of spending all your time on building all this barn to keep your stuff. Don't you know that tonight your soul is required of you? What is God telling him in this parable? What's going to happen to this man? What does it mean that his soul is required of him this day? What's going to happen? Vera, say it. He's going to die. This is the day that he will die. And his soul will be taken out of his body. That's, that's the, what he's saying here. Your soul will be taken from your body. Your body will lie fallow. It will lie untouched in the grave. Your soul will be elsewhere, but you, your body will no longer have any life. Uh, that's the point I'm trying to make here. <coughs> So death is a separation of the soul from the body. So when you go to a funeral, uh, and you may not have a pastor that can actually say it right, because he may not know it right, but what we're dealing with is a, a material body who no longer has that breath of life in it, uh, but an eternal soul, a soul that's either never believed and on its way to the lake of fire, or a soul that has believed in the Lord Jesus, who's face-to-face uh, -face with the Lord Jesus Christ along with the spirit that it has. That's what we're dealing with. You say, Rick, well, when will that end? What will happen to Robert King Sr. who's in the grave? How does this end? What happens in the future? You want me to tell you? What happens in the future is one day, according to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, God the Father will tell Jesus Christ, go back to earth and claim what's yours, claim your prize, claim what you've worked for, take the Christians off the earth. This is an event we call the rapture. And the rapture says in 1 Thessalonians 4 that the dead in Christ will rise first. Everybody who is dead and laying in the ground, their souls and their spirits will come back with Jesus Christ. They will re-enter those bodies. They will come back to resurrected life. That body will be given life again, but this time not this kind of life where my eyes are failing and everything that's going wrong with this carcass. Uh, we could go around the room and see what's failing, right? A different kind of life. A glorified, immortal, imperishable life. A life of no more pain, no more sorrow, no more tears, no more physical ailments. God's people said, Amen. That's what happens. That's what's next. When you bury your mothers and your fathers and your grandparents and your friends like Sarah did, uh, so many of her friends that she buried this last week, that's what happens. We're awaiting the rapture of the church. The dead in Christ will rise first. Their, body, their souls and spirits reunited with their bodies to eternal life. The scripture says, and, and we that remain alive will be caught up together with them in the clouds so that where Jesus Christ is, there we may also be. That's the rapture of the church. That's what's next. So we bury our loved ones, the next person to die in this church. It's either going to be you or me. But whoever it is, that's the fact of what we're doing. We're laying their body entombed, almost protecting it, so that it can one day be glorified. You know, this is a crazy world. And there are so many people that tell us 
uh, the psychological types. There are so many people beating down on us. Uh, you're not worthy of this. You're not worthy of that. There's, there's so much negativity. There's so much hatred in this world where every group's pointing at the other group and saying uh, just horrific things about everybody. But this is our truth. We have been raised up with Jesus Christ. We are as good as resurrected with the, the, the Lord God. We have a new life. We have a new set of truths in our new life. And that's why we should be living differently than we were before we were saved. Because I'm telling you, we are entirely different than we were before we were saved. Whether you've come to understand it through a study of the Scripture or not, we are entirely entirely different. We have a human spirit now. We have God the Holy Spirit inside of us. We are forgiven of our sins. We're children of God. We're members of the body of Christ. We're members of the bride of Christ. We have God the Holy Spirit in us. We have God the, whole, God the Father in us. We have God the, Jesus, uh, God the Son, Jesus Christ, indwelling us in us. If you're at this crossroads and you're trying to figure out who am I, what does God want me to be? Those are your truths. Stand up, Christian. You are a new life and you should live as new life. With new life, new spirit life, new spiritual life comes new living. I told you at the beginning, and I've got to stop here with this, just because it cost you nothing to be saved, it should cost you your life to live like Christ. He that surrenders his life will find it. That's Christianity. Entrance into the Christian life is a split-second decision. It's not a work of man for God. It's God's work for me. He did this through the cross of Jesus Christ. He saved me, forgave me, placed me in union with Him. But my life as a Christian now should be entirely different than it was before. If the Bible says you can do it, you can do it. New Testament Bible. And every one of you listen to me. I'm yelling at myself. If the Bible says you can't do it, stop doing it. You live in a way that pleases your God. You are His child. <clears throat> new life demands new rules for living. And to whom has been given, much is required. And to each one of you and me, everything's been given to us. Everything that pertains to life and godliness. Everything that we need to live a life that, that appears as Jesus' life, that imitates Him on this earth. Everything, every tool we need. It's like a mechanic saying, I need a, a 9 16 inch wrench. Everything you might need to complete your job of of being transformed, God's work in you, of transforming you, everything you need is there already. All the spiritual DNA, 100% in place. It's your choice and my choice, whether we grow up into that adult son or whether we stay infants fighting against our God, kicking against the goads. It's our choice. Paul says, you have been raised up with Christ have your focus, as we'll talk about next week, your focus should be on Him, His character, His lifestyle, what He would approve, what He loves, what He did, how He said it, how He acted. That should be your focus, learning everything you can about this Christ and living like Him, not like your old self. Enough for today? Let's close in prayer.